Verse 6. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told uh, what you must do. So, uh, we'll continue. Go ahead. Verse 7. While the men were traveling with Saul, stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. So this... This experience left him stunned, overwhelmed, silent, and blind. Verse 8 goes on. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could see anything. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. Verse 9. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. So we're, we're not told in this passage he said another word. He, was, he had been beaten. He had been down. He is, he is broken. The city he hoped to purge of believers, he couldn't even physically see anymore. In this state of spiritual trauma, he couldn't even eat or drink. He was a broken, broken man. You know, I, there was this song I used to sing when I was younger. Brandon may know it. Um, it. It was this praise chorus we always sang. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. You guys know that one? Anybody here know that one? Holiness is what you want from me. Right? So it, it's a beautiful praise song. Very, very spiritual, man. You're singing that song. Arms are up. Everyone's smiling and crying. It's a beautiful song. But you know the second verse of that song is brokenness, brokenness is what I long for, brokenness is what I need, brokenness, brokenness is what you want from me. Man, I was a good Christian kid. I sang that song all the time. I sang it with so much spiritual zeal. Jesus just knew I meant it from the heart. But I had a conversation with a youth pastor friend of mine who experienced a brokenness I've never seen before. All at once in his life, boom, something happened with his family, his marriage, his parents, and his job. All at one time. And I remember having a conversation with him, two hours, talking to him. I didn't say anything. He just talked the whole time. And he says, you know what? You better be very careful if you pray for brokenness or you sing for brokenness because you better be prepared for it to happen. I'm scared to sing that song. I don't know if I can handle it. Saul was on the ground, blind, couldn't eat, couldn't drink. He was broken. So when you think about the kind of individual Saul was, you realize that the only kind of overwhelming experience that might have transformed him was something like this. He needed it. You've heard people say, I had the come to Jesus moment. Well, Jesus came to Saul. And he must have heard Stephen's sermon. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And Saul was there giving approval to his death. You know, one of the last things Stephen says is, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Receive me in your spirit. He heard the sermon. He saw what happened to Stephen. You don't think Saul is very aware right now of everything that is on him and that the decision he has to make Saul had apparently confronted the apostles themselves. He continued to persecute believers. Th it is possible that only a shocking, soul-crushing experience like this could have reached him and changed him. So we read, and we're going to continue to read, but here's the next thing. Saul was so changed that he later willingly suffered great price for being a Christian. Again, a whole other sermon can be preached on these verses that I'm going to skip. But there's a story of a man whose name is Ananias. He was a follower of the way. He was in his house praying by a window. And God comes to him. Jesus comes to him and says, Hey, Ananias, I need you to go down to this place. I'm going to give you the name of the street. It's called Straight Street. I want you to make way. I want you to go in haste. I want you to go fast. And when you get there, I want you to find a man named Saul. And Ananias is like, <laughs> Say what? Saul? God, and he starts to have a conversation. God, do you know who Saul is? I mean, I know you're God, but I don't think you know who Saul is. Because Saul is looking to destroy me. He wants to kill me. He's breathing murderous threats to me. He's looking to wipe out the entire followers of the way. Why is it you want me to go see him? And they have this conversation, this, not an argument, but a conversation. And finally, when we pick up here in verse 15, the Lord says to Ananias... Go! Exclamation point. It's kind of like God saying, okay, I hear you, but now I need you to go. Exclamation point. 
This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Ananias had an assignment. He heard the Lord called his name. Now he had to go to Saul. He knew whom, when, where. And it was time to go. But before he went, the Lord gave him the why. He says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, to the kings and the people of Israel. Saul of Tarsus had been called for a very special mission. The chosen instrument. And Ananias, through Saul, would just be another person that God has used to pave the way for Saul to do exactly what God needed him to do. And not only would this Saul, uh, would this uh, be a special implement of God, but Saul would also suffer. Verse 16 says this. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Saul had persecuted the church. He caused Jesus to suffer. But Ananias understood that Saul was a changed man. And he goes to the man, in verse 17 it says, When then Ananias went to the house, entered it, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. That is the love of God that can transform even Ananias to look at this man who is breathing murderous threats to say, Brother. Brother Saul, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That leads us to number two. We must be willingly allow God to take charge of our plans and goals for the future. You have to willingly allow God to take charge of your plans and goals for the future. You know, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I never, when I graduated high school, I didn't go to school to be a youth minister. I actually was going to school to be a music teacher. My, my uh, instrument of choice was voice. I took, I was singing all the arias and stuff that you have to do. I had private lessons. I also played cello and percussion. And, uh, and so I would, I would uh, I'd have to go to class. And I was in a number of chamber choirs and stuff. And I was even in a men's ensemble. And all we did were Disney songs because the chicks really dig them. But... <laughs> But I, I, that was my desire, was to be a music teacher. I loved music. I liked, I felt like I, teaching was going to be cool. So uh, I liked being in band and choir and all that stuff in high school. So I was like, that's what I want to be. But after my third semester in Rhode Island College, I, I got into a car accident. I took away my transportation. My job was failing me. My, the plate that my roommate was moving. And all these things came crashing down. And I didn't have anything. And I called up my mom and dad. And said, Mom, Dad, can I move back in, please? So I moved to Florida. And while I was here, I started attending the church that my parents were going to. It was the chapel on the military base. And they said, hey, you know, you're, you're young. That means you're qualified. You want to come and help with our youth group? I was like, okay, sure, no problem. I liked youth group. It was fun when I was in there. I, was only, I only did it for two years because I gave my life to Christ when I was a junior in high school. So youth group was kind of still new to me. But I was like, yeah. And I taught some Bible studies and, and went on trips and went skiing and stuff like that. And about a year later, one of the, uh, the senior chaplain resigned and was taking a church in town. And he said, hey, um, Tony, would you be willing to come and uh, be the youth director at our church? And I was like, I don't know. All my friends are here. kind of like it here. He says, well, we'll pay you 500 bucks a month. I was like, 500 bucks? 500 bucks? That is awesome! You're going to pay me to do this job? $500 a month? Then sign, dude, sign me up. I don't got to pray about it. God just told me. He said it in, what, in $500. That's what he told me. That I'm going to be the youth director at this church. And I mean, it was a small, small church. I mean, we had four or five kids to start. But you know, so things started happening, started to grow. I was working as a land saver and as a manager at McDonald's. This was my third job. And God said, we, we grew to like 25 kids in like the first year for four. And it was, it was working. And, and, and I don't mean to sound prideful, but I was, I was pretty good at it. You know, a lot of people were telling me and encouraging me that. And it, for three years I did that. And it was just really great until enough people were coming to me and said, Tony, you know what? I think you need to do this full time. They pay people to do this full time? <laughs> to go skiing and go on roller coasters and all this fun stuff to go to camp? I get to be paid to do this full time? Went back to school. The Lord took my plans, put them aside, and I started to follow his plans 
Last June was my 20th year in paid student ministry. And it has been an amazing ride. I wouldn't give it up for anything. You think I'm upset that I'm not a music teacher today? You think there's any doubt in me? I'm like, oh, well, if I would have been a music teacher, I would have been so much better in life. No, God has blessed me so much. And he did the same for Saul. Saul's plans for his future were dramatically changed when God took control of his life. And we, he allowed God to, when we, listen, when, we, when we're like Saul and we allow God to take control of our lives, it's not something we should be afraid of. I think a lot of times people are afraid to come to God and say, well, I don't want to do for God because he's going to make me change some of the things that I like to do in my life. Maybe. Or, or, or then he's gonna, you don't want me to go to church every day and stuff and, and like help out and go to the potlucks and stuff. Well, maybe. But let me tell you something. When you allow God, there's no fear there. There's only peace. And I don't mean, listen, hey, if I follow God, I mean that means coming to church every Sunday. I'm really holy. No, no, I mean God, it's not about in this, it's not about this building, it's about your life. It's about getting together as a family to pray. It's about maybe giving up some of the things that you would normally do because God wouldn't honor that. When that happens in your life, you will have peace. There's a man, I want to show you a video by the name of Nick Cruz. And Nick, by the way, I'm going to go about 10, 15 over. If you have to leave, I will not be offended. I, I apologize. But um, I didn't think I was, but first service I did. So I'm going to just tell you right now and be honest with you. But I want to show you this quick video. It's about four minutes long. It's about a guy named Nick Cruz. And he did not have peace in his heart. He was a broken, broken man. But God sent someone along to pave the way for him to do great things. And if it goes out here, just turn around and look it up on the screen. Go ahead, Alex.